this is a very big job, a very big task. In fact, it's the most important task facing the human population today. Because if we don't solve this problem, we're headed to catastrophe because we're coming to the end of what the planet can provide us. We're coming to the very end. So we have to come up with a new system of consumption of the use of resources. So it seems to me we have to proceed on two tracks, two different tracks. One track is to use what's left much more efficiently and much more prudently. What we have left, we, we can't waste it anymore. We can't use automobiles that get only 10 miles per gallon. We have to use automobiles that get 100 miles per gallon, for example. Every, we have to use what's left very, very efficiently. So one side of the, one track is efficiency, so that we slow down the consumption of what remains on the planet. The other track is to develop alternative materials that are renewable, not just energy, but everything else, because we're running out of everything else. So we have to develop renewable forms of energy, but also renewable building materials and renewable every, everything so that we don't rely any longer on non-renewable materials. So we have to proceed on two tracks, efficiency, conservation on one hand, and the development of renewable materials on the other. And this is a very urgent task. So that, that's the beginning of the answer. There are many governments in the world and many corporations and the different and this will become a struggle for survival as conditions on the planet deteriorate, which I believe they will. Governments will understand that they must adapt to the new circumstances. And governments that make adaptation sooner will be the ones that will prosper in the years ahead. So eventually this will become a competitive struggle to develop renewables. Many countries will say, no, 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 no. We're not gonna go, we're not gonna bother with renewables. We'll continue on the path we've always been on. But other governments are going to say, wait a minute, um, th this, is, this is a mistake. This is suicidal to proceed the way we always have. We have to make adaptation. We have to make adjustments. And those governments will take leadership and they will be the ones that will prosper. And eventually, people will see that the ones that are making the adaptations are going to prosper economically. So there will be an imitation process that will eventually take place. So I see this as a competitive struggle. And so it, it, it's not that everybody is gonna wake up one day and say we need renewables. That's not going to happen. But some governments are going to say, we will, take, we will take the leadership. For example, Germany has decided to take leadership in the development of renewable energy, especially solar and wind power. They are the ones who are moving fastest in this direction. But so, so, are the lead, so is the leadership in China, saying we're going to become the leaders in solar power and wind turbines, and they have made tremendous strides in this. They see this as an economic advantage, and I think that this will be the way that this will happen, that some countries will lead, some countries, some corporations will move ahead faster, and that will lead other people to realize that if they don't move in that direction, they will fall behind. But it's gonna take a while, and we see this we see this, for example, in my country, in the United States. In different parts of the United States are moving at a different pace. For example, California is moving very rapidly in the direction of renewables. They have adopted legislation in California requiring that, they, that all the utilities and refineries adopt very strict environmental and climate standards 
as if California had signed the Kyoto Protocol and is abiding by very strict international standards. So there is a, now a big market in California for solar panels and other renewable energy. Then you look at Texas, for example, and there's no such legislation and, and, and very little progress. Some, but very little. So there's, and, and so I believe that California will see economic benefits from that. And eventually, I believe everybody will say, look what they're doing in California and try to catch up. So I think it will happen that way as a competitive struggle. I, I, I don't know how things will develop in Mexico. My impression is that, that Mexico, because its economy is so heavily dependent on oil exports, is not making progress on renewable energy. And I think I understand the economic reasons for that, because the Mexican government is so dependent on income from oil revenue. 34% of the, of the income of the Mexican government, the central government, comes from oil revenue. So it has an incentive to continue producing oil. But I think in the end, it, Mexico will be at a disadvantage if it doesn't develop alternative forms of energy. Because Mexico is at a, Mexico is at a particular risk to climate change more than other countries because of its location, its agricultural base, and its need for water to grow crops. Mexico is at a very extreme disadvantage as climate change progresses. So I believe that Mexico should be among the leaders in the drive to slow down the process of climate change. And this is in total opposition to a policy of promoting oil. The two are in contradiction with one another. And I hope that in time, the leaders of Mexico understand that this, uh, appreciate this contradiction and take steps to improve Mexico's commitment to renewable energy. I think that students of international relations have to think on many levels simultaneously, which is not so easy to do. It's not easy for me, and I've been doing this for 40 years, so it's, it's difficult. If we think about the future, well, let me put it this way. When I began work in this field, my, my background is in war and peace studies. And when I began work, uh, and when I first came here to UNAM 40 years ago, I, I spoke about the arms race between the US and the Soviet Union. And all that I worried about then was the military balance between the US and the Soviet Union and the nuclear balance and arms and alliances. And that's how you studied international relations in that time. Now, to study international relations, you have to know many more things. You have to know economics, you have to know trade, you have to know energy, because energy is so crucial to international relations today. And you have to know the environment. So the way I explain this to my students is we're going from the three A's, the letter A, to the three E's. The three A's were arms, armies, and alliances. And the three E's are economics, energy, and the environment. It's international relations in the future will be dominated by economics, energy and the environment and you have to be know about all of those and how they connect to one another. Now of course I could say more about that but for example in, in, in when I started teaching when you t spoke about US Soviet relations all you had to know about was the three A's armies arms and alliances but now 
The most important international dynamic, I believe, is between the U.S. and China. And the most important issues between the U.S. and China are economics, economics and trade, energy, the energy competition between the U.S. and China, and environment, because the U.S. and China are the most important contributors to global warming. And so to solve global warming will require cooperation between the U.S. and China. So maybe that's a way of understanding what, how the world has changed. Uh, th this is going to ha happen partly as a result of circumstances, changing conditions, economic forces and environmental forces, and partly due to growing consciousness. So nothing will happen all at once. Uh, I, I think that economic forces will require change. The cost of producing oil and natural gas is going to increase. This has to happen because we have already consumed what everybody in the industry calls easy oil. The oil that's easy to extract because it's close to the surface or close to shore and easy to refine like the oil in Texas, that's now gone. The oil that remains is tough oil, hard oil. It's very hard to produce. It's in the Arctic or in the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. It's very expensive. It, it costs, it, the easy oil in Saudi Arabia costs $1 per barrel to produce. The oil in the Arctic costs 70, 80, 90 dollars to produce. So the cost of energy will rise. This will force people to use energy more, much more efficiently or to switch to renewables. So that's the economic pressure. On the other hand, people are becoming more aware of the dangers of climate change. And that will make people alter their behavior. We just had, in, in my part of the world, we just were affected by Hurricane Sandy, had a powerful impact. Now, where I live was on the edge of the storm. We had only a little bit of damage, but all my friends in New York City and Connecticut had tremendous damage. The effects were catastrophic in New York City. And people now understand that climate change is not some imaginary issue. It is a very real issue. New York City was shut down for a week, really totally shut down. And this is going to be more and more common. So this will force people's consciousness to change. And this will move things more in the direction of renewables. So it's a combination of economic forces and consciousness change. He did not talk about climate change. He moved away from what he said four years ago. He was silent on the issue because the Republicans were attacking him on the issue of jobs. They, and so he didn't say anything that implied a threat to jobs. So he didn't say anything about fracking, the process of, of fracking for oil and natural gas in shale gas formations or Arctic drilling or anything that raised the issue of climate change. He was silent. Oh, I, I think civil society is very important. And in the past year, we've seen some very significant examples of this. In Japan, after the Fukushima disaster, uh, the Japanese government tried to cover up the sloppy, uh, the neglect and the inferior operations at the Fukushima plant. The government tried to cover up and the government tried to uh, find a way to resurrect 
nuclear power and the public is, in Japan people, civil society is usually very quiet, but there have been huge protests in Tokyo against nuclear power. And this has forced the government to say, we're not gonna go back to nuclear power. So you've had a big change in Japan. In Germany, uh, they were going to continue nuclear power as a bridge to, to uh, renewable energy. But after Fukushima, there were such huge protests in Germany that they've eliminated nuclear power. In China, we don't think of China as having active civil society, but there have been giant protests against refineries and coal plants, spontaneous, they're not organized in the same way that they are perhaps in Mexico or the United States, but they are organized by social media, by Twitter and cell phones. Huge numbers of citizens have come out to protest coal plants and new refineries and petrochemical facilities. And as a result, the government has had to back down. And the new government, the new, uh, the new head of the Communist Party uh, has said that, that environmentalism is now going to be a priority for China. So I do think that civil society has an impact on energy issues. And I predict this will be increasingly the case in the future. Now the Arctic, nobody paid attention very much to the Arctic uh, except fishing people, uh, but because they now believe that one third of the world's remaining hydrocarbon resources, oil and natural gas is located in the Arctic, which is only 6% of the Earth's surface, but has 30% of the world's oil and natural gas. So this is becoming a major target for the oil and gas companies for exploration and extraction. And this poses all kinds of problems because the area is very fragile from an environmental perspective. So any drilling in the Arctic will uh, involve great risk to the ecosystems there. It's also an area that has some of the last indigenous tribes, the Inuit people, the Laps of Scandinavia, who still practice a traditional way of life. Other issue in the Arctic is that the boundaries are not fully defined. So there is a risk of geopolitical conflict. And already there has been the uh, emergence, emergence of geopolitical friction in the Arctic between Russia and Norway, and Norway and, and um, I'm sorry, um, Canada and Greenland and Canada and the United States and the United States and Russia. All of these boundaries are undefined, and there's, so there has been argumentation about where the boundaries are and all of these countries are building up their military capacity to operate in the Arctic. So this could be one of the epicenters of geopolitical conflict as we move deeper into the, into the 21st century. My name is Michael Clare. Uh, I am a professor of peace and world security studies and I teach at five schools in Western Massachusetts.